hurts, having some stiffness in your joints. And he said, you just praise him. You know, sometimes we don't know what God's going to do, we just praise him. Man, the Bible said he inhabits the praises of his people. He's with us all the time, but he comes down in a special way when we praise him. So just lift your hands and just give him a wave offering as you take your seat.
Apostle Covington will be ministering on Friday night. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm presenting a workshop in addition to some other people on Friday. And on Saturday, um, we will have workshops during the day and there will be a, um, also another speaker uh, kind of somewhere around the lunch or at thereafter. And so therefore, uh, the evening will be free and the end, the revival, uh, the conference will end on Sunday morning. So keep that in prayer, amen, and lift up all of our speakers and especially pray for your pastor, amen. I'm speaking on a subject called Hold Me. Amen. <laughs> H-O-L-E, me, M-E. And it's for me to talk about what it's like to be a single pastor. Isn't that amazing? Amen. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> Who thought that I would get to tell somebody about that? God is good, isn't he? Amen. So let's get right into the message this morning. <clears throat> I just want to review with you just a little bit, and then we're going to get into the message. Last week I talked to you about revival and, and, and what the definition of revival is. And so this morning, I'm going to expand that definition a little bit because when we talk about a revival, it is an awakening. It is a refiring. It's a refocusing. In fact, one translation of revival comes because revival comes from the word revive. It's like a reviving. It's a revitalization of beliefs. Now, most of the time when I grew up, I thought revival meant it was for the unsaved. And it's not that we don't want to reach the unsaved, but revival is to revive the people that are already born again. Amen. You hear me? And so now, but at the same time, we do want to reach the unsaved. So we want to bring those who are not saved or invite them to join us on Facebook. Can I get an amen? Amen. But by definition, I want to use the definition that a revival is the awakening or the quickening. That's that reviving of God's people to their true nature. And that true nature is a divine nature because the Bible says that God has given us great and precious promises that by those promises we might be partakers of his divine nature. So as we walk in the will and the purpose of God, we take on his divine nature. The Bible says we are new creatures. I'm not the old normal that I was when I was born in my mother's womb, thank God. And he knew me when I was in my mother's womb, but when I accepted Jesus as my Savior, I became a new creature. The Bible also defines that as new creation. That has given me a new nature. Amen. I, the, the unrighteousness that was like a filthy rag became righteous because Jesus made me the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So we are awakened to the divine purpose, divine plan, or divine nature, and we are also awakened to his divine purpose. So somebody say awakening, awakening. to divine purpose divine. and divine nature. Divine. When we often talk about revival, we usually think about it from one perspective, just as uh, a church having a service. And we look forward to it every year, and somebody said, and we should. we should. But we also should expect it to be ongoing. There should be a change in our life where we are revitalizing and we are refired. And there's a fervency in the Holy Ghost that's renewed and rekindled. You remember in Revelations where God uh, talks, uh, where the Lord is talking to John. The revelator, he talks about having left your first love. Sometimes we forget what our relationship was with God when we first got born again. Amen. We got born again, and I don't know about you, I was excited, I was on fire, I wanted to be in church as much as I could, I wanted to hear the word, I wanted all that God had for me. Anybody else was like that? Well, that's the way God wants us to be. Amen. I was telling Sister Karen on the way here, I said, one of the things that I find is the more I learn, the more I realize I don't know. And it keeps me pressing. It keeps me reaching. And you know what? That's so good. And not just for me, but for you as well. Because when you have an appetite to learn more and to do more, God is willing. When he says, if you hunger and thirst after righteousness, you shall be filled. Can I get an amen? amen. So it's not just limited to a church or a Christian group or to a community. 
It's a movement. Somebody say a revival. revival. This, revival this revival is a movement. So somebody said, let's get on, let's get on. on board with the movement. Oh. Now, I want you to hear this, that how do we get a revival to happen? You know, some people think, you know, it's up to the pastor. It's up to the evangelist. It's, it's up to somebody else. And you just kind of, uh, you get the, somebody else gets the fire burning and you join in. But somebody said, that's not the right perspective. The right, right perspective is for all of us yeah. to rekindle our fire to have a fervency in the Holy Ghost. Can I get an amen? All of us desire God to move in a supernatural way. And this is what God was talking to me about this morning. This is why I love praise and worship too, because even in worship and praise, God begins to speak and gives you even clearer understanding for me anyway. But this morning as we were worshiping, God began to show me how that when Jesus went into his own hometown. Now you go back and you look at Luke, and 18, Jesus says, I'm anointed to preach the gospel to yeah, the poor. Yeah. To sit at liberty those that are bruised, to open blinded eyes, to set the captives free. Y'all you know that scripture, yeah. right? And, and so now we know Jesus is anointed because he says it himself. We have a record of it. But now he goes into his own hometown. And the Bible says he was not able to do many miracles. Not that he wasn't anointed. But he was not able to do many miracles because of unbelief. So unbelief, I believe it when I see it. That's unbelief. I know what God says, but somebody said that's unbelief. So what am I saying? They had unbelief and because they had unbelief, even though they had the best, they had Jesus himself. Anointed. Ready. He could not do many miracles. He said it said he prayed for a few people. Then it says he went about preaching the gospel. He went about preaching and teaching because that's the way that you get people out of unbelief. Yeah. Faith comes by yeah. and hearing by. Yeah. Yes. So when God brought that to me this morning, he said, I desire to do more. He said, let me. So look at your neighbor and say, God is saying, let me do more. Yeah. Tell one more person. Yeah. He said, I need your faith. God has said, I need your faith to be elevated. I need your faith to begin to expect. See, when you come in, and let's say you had a rough week, and you come through those doors, and you come in with an attitude, I had a rough week, but I know it's going to be better when I leave here. Somebody say, that's belief. I may be hurting in my body. This morning I had an episode. I came in to get my temperature checked. And when I, I had to go in to get my mic, I, re, I put some more new batteries in. And I was waiting. I waited for Brother Kelly and got my batteries in. And I was coming down the steps. As soon as I um, um, came down the steps, they said that Sister Cindy had had a, an episode with vertigo. You know, y'all yeah, know what I did, don't you? Yeah. What did I do? Yeah, I went into prayer mode. You know what I'm saying? It wasn't like wait till I preach and, and I have finished. It was prayer mode time then. Right. Yeah. And I want you to come to a point that when there are episodes, wherever they are, on the parking lot, in the church, in the vestibule, in the kitchen, hello, in the fellowship hall, wherever, did you go into what? Yeah. We ought to be in prayer mode all the time. Yeah. We began to pray. She was praying with me. And as we prayed, and I stopped praying, she said, I feel better. Amen. 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 Come on, don't pay, pay, pay. about me. Yeah. It's about the God. That is a healer. Yeah. So it takes tender hearts and humble spirits and those of who will press in, who will be committed to cry out for revival. Have you been crying out for revival to be manifested? I know you have. I hear you when you're being in on Wednesday nights for prayer. And I thank you. I want you to know I was on on Wednesday night. I was just in the mountains up there where sometimes you don't have a very good signal, but I was on. I want you to know that I'm on most Wednesdays. 
But at the same time, I was not necessarily, I didn't want to try to pray and be going in and out. But you know what? It's so important that we all join in. Yeah, yeah. Six o'clock, Wednesday nights, is our time to come together and pray and intercede for this revival because revival breaks out when there's prayer. Yeah. And I get an amen. Amen. I know that you've read about people who have been instrumental in revival. I, I've been reading about people like Whitfield and Jonathan Edwards and uh, the, we the John uh, uh, Wesley, the Wesley brothers, and uh, Amy Simple McPherson. Those are revivalists, just to name a few. But when you look at it, you can even name Billy Graham, who was a great revivalist. When you think about that, these people trusted God. And as I was doing some study this week, what I saw is they were committed to trust God. Not their own interpretation of the scripture, but to trust God. Somebody said, we got to trust God. <laughs> so God doesn't just send revival randomly, but God sends revival to those that have a hunger and those who have a thirst. And what am I saying? Revival can break out with one person. Amen. I read about Amy Simple McPherson. <laughs> that child was something else. She would get her a chair, go downtown, stand on the chair, and just look up like this. Still, like this. And she went to about 50 people would gather around. When all the 50 people are so gathered around, because you know they all wanted what's wrong with her, right? <laughs> she would jump down off of her chair and grab her chair and go run into her mission. She said, follow me. And they would have followed her. She'd get them in there and they'd tell, she'd tell the usher to lock the door. <laughs> and she'd preach to them. Tell me, created? Yeah. <laughs> that woman, I can't remember, I believe it was a, a building that seated about 5,000 or 10,000 people, I don't remember now. But she built and erected a, uh, uh, an edifice so big, even during a time where it was like a depression. They didn't have a lot of money. But she built it that free. And not only that, she was able to fill it four times a day. Mm. To fill it with 5,000 people four times a day is a major thing, isn't it? Yeah. I'm like, what? This is what, this, this is the, the anointing that was upon her life. So I want you to understand, we're over here in Montcure, North Carolina. But do you know there's some people, even in Africa, that know where you are? We have people that view us on Facebook, am I right about it? From Africa. So you think nobody knows where we are. Somebody say, yes, they do. Hello, somebody. Amen. So you don't know. They might be making plans to come. We met somebody from Canada when I was on vacation back in April, and she said, well, I'm coming to North Carolina. Hmm. Well, guess where she's coming? She's coming to North Carolina. Yes, she is. Yes, she is. When the Spirit speaks to us about the condition of our heart and how we need to walk in obedience to God, that's the beginning of that conviction. And if we move with it, now there are times, now you have to be honest, there, there, there are times that you've been convicted. You knew in your heart that God was saying you need to do X, Y, and Z. And you delayed. Yeah. Yeah. Every time God said X, Y, and Z, you haven't obeyed. Neither have I. However, when God is convicting us and God is drawing us and God is showing us what we can have and what he wants to take us, or just say, follow me, because he doesn't always tell us everything, does Amen. he? But how we need to do is trust God. And if we trust him, things are always going to be better for us. Amen. Now, I'm not telling you that they're going to always meet your expectation. Mm -hmm. Because there are times we pray for things and they didn't happen like we expected. Y'all don't be quiet on me. We've asked God to do stuff. And he didn't do it the way we wanted it. Come on. Amen. But it's still about us trusting him. Yeah. It's still about us honoring him. Yeah. And knowing that he's always working together for our good because we love him. And yeah. we are called yeah. according to his purpose. Can amen. I get an amen? amen? So let me get into the meat of the message. God told me to tell you this morning, place a demand on the anointing. Somebody say it. Place a demand on the Say it one more time. Place a demand on the anointing. Now, an anointing means 
that there is an expression of the supernatural power of God. It's really where the power of God comes upon the person or the flesh. In the Old Testament, you saw that when the uh, tabernacle was erected, God gave special anointings for those two to uh, make the curtains and, and uh, deal with the bronze and deal with the uh, brass and the silver and those kinds of things. There was a special enabling that came. We read the New Testament and we see Jesus say, I'm anointed to preach the gospel. Is that right? So I want you to know it's the power of God upon the life of that individual. But you know you are all anointed because we have Jesus in our life. Yes. But the Holy Spirit has a way of moving in our midst in supernatural ways and he chooses whom he will use. Yes. Can I get an amen? amen. So somebody say, I have a hunger for the anointing amen. to increase in my life. But I'm also expecting the anointing to be increased upon our revivalism. So how do you place a, a demand on the anointing? When you place a demand on the anointing, that means that you have a deep desire. Somebody say deep desire. And a hunger for supernatural manifestation of God's power. So I ask you a question. Do you have a super, do you have a hunger and a desire, a deep hunger and desire for the manifestation of God's supernatural power? Think about it. Don't answer right now. Think about it. If you don't, pray and ask God to turn your fire up that you can have a desire that is on the level that he needs it to be for him to manifest himself. He said, let me do it. And that what he said? Amen. Let me work. Let me work. Why do you want to place a demand on that anointing? Well, when you place a demand on that anointing, it causes you and me to enter into the miraculous. And look at this. Paul and Silas were locked up in jail. They got the praise in God. They got the worship in God. Not only were they released, but all those prisoners could have run away. But their praise and their worship got God's attention. Their praise and their worship caused the jail to be born again. Can I get an amen? amen? I want you to go with me to Luke chapter 8. I've read this passage many times, but the Lord told me to look at this differently, and I'm looking at it in a new, in, I usually look at this in Mark. But God said look at it in Luke. In Luke chapter 8, familiar scripture, beginning at verse number I believe that is, you know, it's really small, you know. 41, I believe. So it was when Jesus returned that the multitude welcomed him, for they were all waiting for him. And behold, there came a man named Jairus, and he was a ruler of the synagogue. And he fell down at Jesus' feet and begged him to come to his house. Somebody said, that's a demand, isn't it? That's a demand. <laughs> For he had an only daughter about 12 years of age, and she was dying. It was his only daughter. I have one child, so I can I sense what that might have been like to have your only child that's sick, laying at a point of death. In one translation, I believe Matthew says the child is dead. But it's written in multiple gospels. It says, but as he went, the multitudes thronged him. Now a woman have a flow, a flow of blood for 12 years who has spent all of her livelihood on physicians and could not be healed by any came from behind and touched the border of his garment and immediately her flow of blood stopped. Now I've preached this before and I know you've heard this before but I want you to hear this. Jairus' daughter is his only daughter, lying at the point of death, or she's already dead. There's an urgency. 
He wants Jesus to come with him now. He's been begging Jesus. That's a demand. That, and I'm not saying we even have to beg God, but this is an example of him placing a demand on the fact that he knows Jesus can do something for you. And I ask you this morning, do you know, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that God can do something for you? Do you believe, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that God can turn your situation around? Do you know, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that God is working in your situation and he can change things? Can I get an amen? amen. But then you got this woman that Jesus doesn't know. And she shows up. She's got a dire case as well. I mean, nobody can heal her. She spent all her money on the physicians. And God, thank God for physicians. But these physicians could not heal her or cure her. And so now she's at the mercy of God. And I often remember the testimony of the, I don't remember the guy's name. He was from Africa who came here to minister. And he said, you know what? In America, you're so blessed. You have medical care and you have doctors and you have nurses and you can go to a hospital. He said, but in Africa, many times all we have is God. We've got to believe God when we get into sit, have sickness and disease. But here we are. We have two people who are in dire straits. And I don't know about you, y'all, but I was listening to the news the other day, that 988 number for the crisis number. They were saying it was up. The, the, uh, the calls were up. That was Friday. That they, the calls were up 62% of people calling in because they're having emotional crisis. <clears throat> well, if, if that, that's just, if the number was just released, the, I think maybe what, last weekend? And now 62%, that says there's a dire need for intervention. And Jesus, glory to God, has the answer. Amen. I thank God for counseling. Yeah, well, I didn't have a counselor when I was about to lose my mind. I remember when I went through, I went through postpartum. I remember my mom put me in the bed with her one night. She started praying for me. Because I was just having such emotional turmoil. She put me in the bed with her and I remember her praying. Praying for me and she was praying. I literally saw some creatures. They were big like this. And they were black and white. And it's like they're leaving the land. And they were going into the water and they were splashing. When she finished praying for me, I was back to normal self. Amen. Hallelujah. Yeah. And I'm not saying that you don't need counsel. I'm not saying you don't need help. I'm just telling you that I know God is a mind regulator. Yes, he is. I know he's a heart fixer. <laughs> and that's not a figure of speech. <laughs> Amen. But I'm telling you that God knows how to heal you. That's what Jesus says. I'm anointed to heal. And deliver those that are bruised. Those are people that are emotionally wounded. The anointing will make the difference. But here you got a daughter and only daughter that's lying at the point of death or is dead already. Then you got this woman with the issue of blood that nobody can cure. But she says that I can but touch yeah. the hem of his blood. And she was willing to push her way through great multitudes of people. And that's what I'm saying to you. That's why you got to be hungry. you got to be thirsty. You want to be desperate to get God's attention. When Jesus, when she realized Jesus knew something had happened. And he knew. And I know, you know, those of you who minister, you know you can tell when the virtue of the Holy Spirit is flowing through you, there's a release of God's power. And I can also tell when it's a resistance. 
It's like, mm, 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 mm. It's like a person resists. They resist it. But I want you to know that that power was released for the woman with the issue of blood for 12 long years because she placed a demand. She expected a deliverance. If I can, she said it with her mouth, if I can but touch the hem of his garment, yeah. I'll be made whole. That's the attitude I want you to have from this day forward. Every time you come to this house, and especially during this time of revival, if I could just make it to the house of God, yeah. God's going to give me what I need. Yeah. I was sharing this with Sister Karen this morning. I'm going to share it with you. I was listening to, I believe her name is Donna Shambaugh. And she was saying how that she was in a revival. She said, I was so tired. I was so exhausted. She said, I just wanted to stay in there. And she said, the people came to pick me up for the revival. And she said, I don't remember where she was. But anyway, she said that she just wanted to get it over with. So she got dressed and she went to the service. And she said, when she got to the service, she just wanted to be over with. And so she said, you know, she was going to preach a message. And she was going to do what she felt like she needed to do. And she was going home. And so when she arrived at the venue, the pastor of the church was there. He was really sad because some of his family members had lost their home. Many of them lived in homes with cardboard. And it had rained, and the cardboard boxes had been destroyed. So now they had nothing. And he was devastated, and he was worried about what he was going to do. And so he's praying, so now you got her that just want, doesn't even want to be there, just wants it to be over. And you got him worried about his family, you know what I'm saying? But when it was time for her to lay hands on people, she said, I just laid hands on people. She was really trying to get it over with. But there was a man there, like this woman with the issue of blood, whose belly was full of tumors. And because he came to be healed, he didn't know that she didn't want to be there. He didn't know that the family was devastated. He was there to place a demand on the anointing because he was expecting God to move in his life. Yeah. A couple of days later, a day so later, you hear him talk about how he thought he was dying. Family thought he was dying. Everybody thought he was dying. He decides, I'm going to get married. He calls the pastor to the house so he can perform the wedding. And a, his family shows up, and nobody brings him a wedding present. He is really upset. And he's upset because they didn't bring him a wedding present. He said, they said, we thought you were, we, we came to say our farewells. We thought you were dying. Hmm. Well. So he goes to the doctor. Ask the doctor for another x-ray. The doctor x-rays his stomach and he shows and doctor says, I don't know what happened, but I do know this is what your stomach looked like, full of belly, or full, your belly was full of, of tumors, but now your belly looks like it's a child's belly and, you, and they're all gone. Come on, give God a Yeah, hallelujah. And I want you to see, why am I telling you this story? It is not always about the vessel, it's about She was just laying hands on. Get it over with. But that man placed a demand on their anointing. Just like this woman with the issue of blood placed a demand. Oh my God. On the anointing. Hallelujah. You've got to understand. Sometimes we, we are a, a particular about who and we should. I just need to say, well, won't everybody lay hands on? You really don't. And I know that. But I do want you to believe that we choose here, we try to choose men and women of God that will seek the face of God. Yes, right. Just come in and give you some soup. Give you something that you need. Just come and cry out to God and believe God for an anointing yes. to meet your need. Can I get an amen? amen? So we come with our expectations. Somebody say, here's my cup. Fill it up. Yes. Let it all overflow. So the anointing comes upon us as individuals and upon revivalists and evangelists and apostles and pastors and teachers and evangelists, but it don't have to be a fivefold. The anointing can rest upon you and God can use you. Can I get an amen? Amen. I want you to know this too, that here you see somebody placing a demand on the anointing. 
Now I want to go to the Old Testament real quick. How am I doing? I'm almost, I'm over a little bit, but we praise God a little while. Can you take a little bit more? Amen. Elijah, Elijah and Elisha. Somebody say, some people say Elisha. I say Elisha. Elijah is E-L-I-J-A-H. Elisha is E-L-I-S-H-A. Okay? Are you with me? So, Elisha is, is, is at their plowing with the oxen. And Elijah shows up. Elisha recognizes that this is my mentor. This is my man of God. He kills those oxen. Says farewell to his mom and dad. And he's off with the man of God. There, and if you read this, you look at it in 2 Kings chapter 2, I believe it is. And so, Je Elisha doesn't do anything special. But Elisha knows this is who he is to follow. He recognizes the anointing on this man's life. Elisha, Elijah, is going to Bethel. And he tells Elisha, you stay here, and I'll be back. He said, no, I'm not. He said, that God lives, I am not leaving your presence. I'm paraphrasing. And so he goes with him to Bethel. Well, he says, Elijah says, I'm going to um, Jericho. He says, now you stay here, you stay here. And the Elisha says, no, I'm not staying here, I'm going with you. So he goes with him to Jericho. He went from Bethel, now he's going to Jericho, and now Elijah says, I'm going to Jordan, you stay here, and I'll come back, you know, I'm gonna get you know. Uh, Elijah said, no, I'm going, I'm going with you. So he goes with him. So he's sticking with him, because he knows that's his assignment. So you need to know your assignment. People will criticize you. <laughs> I got a sign. I, I, when I was serving Pastor Curry, I, they told, said we were gay. Because I was with her all the time. So if people will label you. Just need to know who you are. And, um, and I was criticized many times. I think I shared a story with you that one girl said, well, why she get to go with Pastor all the time? And um, I told her, I said, you know, I don't know why God did that. You have to ask him. But this is my assignment, and I'm just going to do what God called me to do. You hear what I'm saying? Amen. You don't really try to explain to people. But let me tell you this. While this was going on, going from Bethel to Jericho and to Jordan, there were prophets, just like Elijah, Elisha. And they were prophets, and they knew that Elijah was going to be called up. And they would say, do you tell Elisha, do you know that your man of God is going to be taken away? He's going to be caught up. They knew what was going to happen to him. And he would say, yeah, just hold your peace. He knew. They knew. But they were not following. They were following at a distance. There's a difference in following up close than there is following at a distance. Yeah. Oh, don't yeah. want to be, you know, I don't want to be too close. You know, I have people in the ministry like that. They, they talk, want to talk to me when nobody else is around. Because they don't want anybody. They want to be incognito. They don't want people to think they're all they're too close. <laughs> yeah, I know that. But anyway, that's another story. And uh, so they knew, and they were following at a distance. But Elijah continued to follow the man of God. And the man of God asked him, what do you want? Somebody say the big ask. The big yeah. ask. Elijah. Elisha. Ask this big question. I want a double portion of your anointing. Somebody said, that's a big ask. Amen. Isn't it? Elijah just said, you ask a hard thing, but if you see me when I'm caught up, you'll help me. So now, it's time for him to go across the water there, Jordan, and he takes his mantle, Elijah does, and he strikes the water with his mantle. And when he strikes the water with his mantle, the waters divide so they can pass over. And Elijah is caught up and taken away. 
and Elijah sees it. The mantle drops. Now, Elijah has to see. Does this work or not? He picks up the man of God's mantle, because the man of God is gone. He picks up the mantle, and he goes back to the water, and he strikes the water, and he says, where is the God of Elijah? And the water's part. Somebody say it's all now. It's all now. <laughs> so he's received the double portion. And if you read the scripture, it said that Elisha performs double the miracles that Elijah did. Sounds like he got the double portion. Amen. Come on and give God praise. I got to close with this one. I, I got to be obedient. Just do everything God said. Is that okay? Amen. God told me to tell you about the 10 letters. The ten lepers show up, and they, they're crying out to, to Jesus about healing them. And Jesus, let's see, this is, um, let's see, what is that one? Um, that one is 17. Let's go with me to Luke 17. I'm almost finished. Just bear with me. Got to get you back. Amen. Is that okay? Amen. Okay. Verse 7, verse 11. Now it happened as he went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. That is, he, that, and then as he entered a certain village, there met him two men who were lepers who stood far off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Somebody said that's placing a demand on the anointing. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, I'm sorry. So when he saw them, he said to them, go show yourselves to the priest. And so it was that they went. As they went, they were healed. How many did I tell you? Two. How many? Ten. 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 There were ten that I'm having trouble with this mic. As you can see, it just fell off. Y'all do? <laughs> can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. So there were ten. And they were all healed. But only one came back to give God glory. But what I want you to see is they placed a demand on the anointing that Jesus had. So just like Jairus, the woman with the issue of blood, like Elisha, the, the lepers, they believed that Jesus could do what he said. And so they placed a demand on the anointed, expecting God to do super abundantly above they, all they could ask or think. And that's what I'm saying to you. Get your expectation up. We've all gone through some things. We've all gone through disappointments. We're all in the, some of us are in the midst of chaos and struggles right now. But get your faith up. You walk through the door Burn it down, but release it now in the name of Jesus. Yeah. And know that the power of God is here to release you from the burden, from the depression, from the chaos. All it took was one word from God, and the order began to uh, change in the creation. So all we need is a word from God. Our attitude is most important. What we expect. Is most important. I can expect, if you know, if you think about the Shabbat painting, who said, I don't even want to be there. I remember back in 2020, I think it was early part of 2021, one morning, here I had come in and I felt so bad. Literally, I felt that I, I felt like I might literally pass out. I felt that bad. And God said, call an altar call. And I'm like, call an altar call. And I feel like I cannot even stand up. Well, you know what I did, right? Oh, to God. Uh, I called an altar call. And I remember laying hands on people, and I remember feeling so weak, feeling like I would literally pass out myself. And you know what I left here? I was fine. <laughs>
Yeah. And God told me to tell you this one, and I'm finished, honestly. This is my last one. <laughs> <laughs>
because we place a demand on the anointing. We are now positioning ourselves, glory to God, for the miraculous. Yeah. Look at somebody, testify, and I'm finished. I, I am positioning myself <laughs> for the miraculous. Got one more person. Yes. 